good afternoon. You're listening to 90.7 WNTU Member Supported Radio. I'm your host, Serena, and this is WNTU Cares Artist Series. And you just heard Robert Trowers on trombone. Trombone is composer, educator on the tune and composition entitled Minority. And I'm going to let you let him tell you about this uh, this tune and this composition. Uh, this is off of his album Point of View on the label Concord Records. So good afternoon, Mr. Charles. How are you? All right. Good to be here. Thanks for thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. And it's actually good to see you. It's been, yeah, it's been a long time. Yeah. Yeah. Not quite a decade yet. I don't Not think, quite. But <laughs> Not too quite. long. <laughs> But uh, I miss your classes, you know, oh, learning wow. about the history of jazz. Thank you so much for imparting that wisdom, telling me to, uh, telling us to, to be publishers. You know, yeah. um, I know there's you have a wealth of information, so I'm looking forward to hearing this conversation well, you know, today. It's, it's about, you know, live long enough and you, and you learn something. Oh, you know? <laughs> right. I, I, I'm, I'm living. <laughs> I'm learning. I'm learning. Yeah. So, wow. But that's, yeah, that's, um. That's why I came down here, anyhow. You know, from Brooklyn. What, what I, mm-hmm. what I know, you know, if it can help someone else, that's that's really what it's all about. You know, if we can send you all out there a little better prepared than we were. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Well, I think that your the light has been shone. Well, shown. You shone the yeah. light on us, and we most of us took it well, and run with ran with it. Sounds good. I'm, I'm happy to hear that. Yes, sir. Yeah. So, minority uh, was this the the tribute uh, to. Well, actually, that was uh, Gigi Grice's tune, Mm -hmm. and Gigi Grice, interesting you should mention that, he was kind of one of my uh, heroes in that he was, uh, along with Gil Fuller and some others, they were really about um, musicians producing their own records, Mm -hmm. having their own publishing companies, Mm -hmm. you know, producing their own concerts, you know, and... uh, he had a he had a rough way to go. It got it got interesting for him because he was pushing that and mm. uh, that. Uh, in fact, if you've heard the Clifford Brown in Paris album, all the arrangements mm-hmm. were his. You know, he was a one hundred percent fantastic arranger and uh, composer and and good good alto saxophone player. You know, the whole whole thing. And uh, so mm-hmm. that was a tune that I I always liked. So and. Um, like I say, this was yeah. from the uh, the album point of view, mm-hmm. which I uh, I named it that because it was all trombones, but it was different guys. That mm-hmm. that particular one I did with uh, Slide Hampton. Yes, yes. And uh, you can definitely tell the difference. The guy that was really smooth and made <laughs> all the changes effortlessly. That was Slide. <laughs> <laughs> oh, don't be so hard on yourself. <laughs> yeah. No, you you definitely approach uh, playing. With a, an ease, there's some type of ease. It's almost like you're playing inside of the beat, or I guess is that what they call the yeah, word jazz? I guess jazz? you could call it that. Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. You know, well, trombone's hard enough. No need to make it any harder. Okay. <laughs> well, well you're making it sound great. Well, let's hear some more of your music. Uh, we have Riff up next, and that's from the same album, Point of View. Right. And uh, actually, all of these uh, songs are from uh, Prodem predominantly or primarily from a uh, point of view which yeah. is a really really great album well thank yeah. you glad you enjoyed it <laughs> I'm, 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 hope, I'm looking forward to uh, our listeners hearing this so let's take a listen to Riff did you want to say anything about this uh, well this was just uh, you know if you know you know what a riff is yes. just a repeated phrase so the melody is just this uh, simple phrase that I came up with and it's um, on a blues here we go 90.7 WNCU Thank you. 
90.7 WNCU. I could have listened to that turnaround for days. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of slightly upset that they were fading out at that point. Because <laughs> you were burning rubber. Have you met Miss Jones off of the album Point of View? Today, during the WNCU Cares Artist Series, Robert Trowers. Mr. Trowers is in the seat. He is sharing and imparting wisdom, words of wisdom. And the song you heard before that, have you met Mrs. Jones is and was Riff, and that's off of the same album. Yeah, right. And uh, Riff was an original, but mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. it didn't have much to it. You know, it's just uh, it was it. like I say, a, a Riff is a simple repeated phrase. So, but I thought it was a it had a, a good amount of punch and yes, you know, feel. So that's that's why I used it. You know. Punch and, and feel, is and that so? Is that a, a target area? Like you want to have, I guess, specific tempos as you start with music, or you decide, hey, look, I want to get this message across. Well, you want to get a message across for sure, mm-hmm. and depending on the the structure of the tune and the melody, that kind of determines to me. That kind of determines what the tempo is going to be. You know, mm-hmm. some melodies just work really well at certain tempos. You know, so it's about figuring out which tempo goes with which melody and hopefully that gets the message across there you go you know i was um so when you're creating this music is there a a reason behind why because uh, jazz has a a rich history you're a professor at at central and at north carolina central university and and you teach us you know about the history of this jazz so Mm -hmm. what what um I guess where I'm getting it, what is the reason why you do what you do and do it so well? Well, I mean, I guess the the first reason is uh, to use Frank or Frank Foster phrase. It this is the music that kind of just hit me in the heart. Mm. You know, it was it's it's uh, something I decided I wanted to be a part of. You know, mm. I um, started undergrad in mechanical engineering because I was Mm. basically a car guy, you know, played trombone some, but uh, after I got more involved in it and listened more, it sort of, I think, I forget who said it best, but uh, he said, you don't pick jazz, jazz picks you. Wow, yeah. And I think that's kind of what happened. It just got to the point where I just felt like, well, I gotta be a part of this. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it. they say jazz is dead, but never. No, no, it's, it's, uh, I think it basically, it, it goes through phases, mm-hmm. you know, it may be, it was pop music at one time. Oh and yeah. If, uh, it probably never will be pop music again, that won't mean it's dead, you know, in a mm-hmm. culture where if it's not popular, it's considered to be dead. Well, some people are always going to feel that way, but, uh, it basically, I think it'll always live as long as there are people who that particular mode of expression appeals to you know yeah, it intelligent to art mm-hmm. yeah i would call it that mm-hmm. well it, it is heard through your music um i want to play some more music from your album this one is statement now is this original yeah this is an original and now yeah. you have two trombonists on here uh, Was, is this the album with the the two drums? Yeah, this is uh, yeah, but uh, this is uh, this is one I did with just quartet. But mm-hmm. yeah, I had um, Al Gray, 
um, Slide Hampton and Fred Wesley on uh, on this album. So, so all that's of their why points I call it of point of view. Right, exactly. <laughs> well, let's listen to this point of view. No, the song is entitled Statement. Uh, right here. After this short pause, you'll be listening to Statement at 90.7 WNCU. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
Beautiful. That tune entitled Statement by Robert Trowers that sits before me. Statement. So what's yeah. the that sounded like a statement. Sounded like something um that had lyrics to it. Do you write poetry? No, I don't. Oh. Uh just just some music. Yeah. But uh yeah, the statement was basically mm-hmm. the melody and the changes. That that was the way I was looking at it. Just the um uh, a statement on a melody over a set of chords. Nothing, nothing deep. Nothing, nothing to no, to pontificate. No, not really. <laughs> and not ponder really. it in a, a pond. No. Yeah. Oh, and man. then the other statement, of course, is the improvisation over the over the chord changes. Yeah. So that was a beautiful tune. It, it reminded you. me of something. I just I don't know what the statement was that it reminded me of. No. It, uh, well, that's a that's a good thing because mm-hmm. you know one of uh, um one person once said to me, yeah, you know that's what I like about jazz. You know, everybody listens to the same thing and they they come up with their own yeah statement about what it's about. So yeah, yeah, it gives you, it has that uh, that ability to evoke certain things. And it, it really it what you get out of the music depends on your own life experience and personality. So. It's it, not limited in that way. It, I guess what's what's the core, the core uh, sound that we look for when we hear in a jazz musician? Is it mm. just approaching the changes, but then you put your own feeling into it? Yeah, you know, so I guess the best the best general term would be uh, individualism. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like every. I mean, that's what you strive for is to be individual. You might not necessarily mm. end up being an innovator, but mm-hmm. If people if people can put on a, an album and say I think that's so and so or that sounds like so then you've you've d- developed an individual so you're not sort a carbon copy in right are there carbon copies in jazz uh, I mean I not know really okay not really I mean uh, the uh, best story I heard about that was um, years ago Art Tatum mm-hmm. you know the great pianist uh, mm-hmm. somebody took him to hear this guy that they said he plays just like you he can play just like you and they went and heard him Mm -hmm. and they asked art they said well what do you think and he said well he definitely knows what i played but Mm. he doesn't know why i played it (laughs) so yeah you know Mm -hmm. so i don't think there are any really carbon Mm -hmm. copies because even when you copy someone note for note i think your personality is going to give certain things and and mm-hmm. your technique mm-hmm. you know your difference in technique and personality is going to make it sound different and speaking of technique who do you study study with uh well you know that, that's a good question i had uh when i started i basically started at one of these home home visit teachers who came and okay I yeah paid, basically learned a couple tunes a week or mm-hmm. whatever and that was pretty much it for about two years. I did that, mm-hmm. and um, after that, it was basically going to uh, you know in New York they had this workshop called the Jazzmobile Workshop, mm. and that was every Saturday. And that's nice. That, it, it was it's like a I Jamie Abershaw camp, but kind of. Okay. But the the only thing is that the people who were running this or teaching at this uh, workshop were some of the, I mean 
best names. I mean, name Curtis a few. Fuller and mm. Curtis Fuller and Charles Stevens were the trombone teachers. Eddie Preston and uh, Jimmy Owens were the trumpet teachers. Jimmy wow. Heath was one of the saxophone teachers. John wow. Stubblefield was another saxophone teacher. Mm -hmm. Freddie Waits and Charlie Persip were the drum teacher mm. instructors. So, and then the big bands. They had two bands: Band A and Band B. And they would either be led mm -hmm. by either Frank Foster, Ernie Wilkins, or Jimmy Heath, depending wow. on who was available. And how that old day. were you when, when this happened? This was, uh, I guess, 19, okay. you know, 19, 20, 21. You know, still in, I was still in college at C okay. City College in New York, but mm -hmm. uh, I was going to that every Saturday once I real once I went the first time. I was like, <laughs> man, I'll be back. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so it was a great experience. Well, I and, like that. Uh, you and you brought that here to uh, Central, to North Carolina Central. Um, well, tried to. Well, you know. when I was here, I definitely experienced that. So thank you. Well, um, and thank you, you know, for letting me know it, I made it here. I, I got it here. <laughs> <laughs> no, you got it before you got here, but yeah, you you definitely brought it here. Uh, so. Ladies and gentlemen, if you've just tuned in, you're listening to 90.7 WNCU, WNCU Cares Artist Series. I'm really enjoying a conversation with Robert Trowers. He's a trombonist, um, uh, educator. He's a historian. What else should I say? Because it's all true. A great song storyteller, songwriter. Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> we're going to go there. about the storytelling okay. part. Huh? Okay. Well, I got stories, you <laughs> <Yeah>. know. <laughs> How well I tell them, I don't know. <laughs> maybe, maybe. <laughs> well, share some with us today. I want to play some more music. This is uh, Sonny Rollins, St. Thomas. And uh, so we're going to speed up the pace a bit. Yeah, well, you know, St. Thomas is, uh, interestingly, uh, I had uh, I had um, heard this too, you know, years ago. Mm -hmm. And um, one, an older, older musician that I knew in New York, who was actually originally from Greensboro, mm. uh, Irvin Stokes. He My was. Uh, he came grounds. up with. Uh, he came up with Lou Donaldson mm -hmm. and, and those uh, those guys, and uh, he told me, you know, all the, all the guys from Brooklyn used to play this tune. Okay. Because it's basically a uh, it's a calypso. Yes. And a lot of the Brooklyn musicians, myself included. Uh, had Caribbean background, okay, you okay. know, so they would play this tune, and uh, so Sonny was, I guess, the first to really record it and put it out there. So wow, okay, so it was a it was a famous a, tune before it was famous. Appar <laughs> apparently, it was a calypso that was familiar. Nice, to, you know, so it was like a pop tune. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. well, let's hear the pop tune after this short pause. Let's listen to Saint Thomas. I'm going to call it popular, popular jazz yeah. tune <laughs> by Robert. It's popular Calypso. <laughs> popular Calypso, <laughs> played by trombonist Robert Trowers at 90.7 WNCU.
WNCU Cares Artist Series with Robert Trowers, and that was hearing Henry Mancini's Mr. Lucky. And I was hearing some really interesting stories about this song, and, and actually your uh, colleagues on this album. Yeah, this was um, actually an album made up of folks that I'd been playing with for uh, a good number of years. Marcus McLaurin on bass, mm -hmm. I, he had been... We played together so many times coming up in New York. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, Jesse Davis, who was the alto player, he we met in the yeah. Illinois Jackette Band, big band. Yeah. And uh, we kind of struck up a friendship. And he was actually the one that's responsible for, for these two albums because oh, yeah. he was... Uh, he was a uh, on Concord okay. already as a Concord artist. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, he said, uh, I think Concord's looking for some other recording artists, so um, mm. if you come and record on my next album, you oh, know, I okay. think they'll probably approach you. And he was right, you yeah. know, actually. <laughs> Two albums I, later. Yeah, I, I didn't have... Uh, I I didn't have that album. I I need to get a copy of it. It was called uh, As We Speak, and uh, but uh, yeah. So I imagine I you just don't stay in contact <laughs> with him. <laughs> well, he's been he's been he lived in Italy now. I would guess oh, at okay. least twenty five years now. Okay, I he's guess been there a long time. So. Time for a trip, huh? <laughs> yeah, really, really good. Oh yeah. man, and you know, and of course, Louis Nash. He's like. Mm -hmm. everywhere now <laughs> everywhere I, yeah I was, and yeah. i remember i uh started uh using him in a group i had a two trombone group when he first kind of got off the road with uh betty carter because one of the my piano players said yeah there's this mm -hmm. this new guy that's in town he was with betty carter for name's lewis nash you know and mm -hmm. he's you know really tasty drummer you should try him sometime and i did and mm -hmm. so we ended up you know yeah 
uh, making tasty music together. together. <laughs> yeah. And the pianist Carl Ace Carter, he was uh, he was in the Basie band. He was from Cleveland, Ohio, and actually a fantastic pianist. Mm -hmm. um, this is only a smattering of what he could do. Really, mm. there's a wealth of information that I'm gathering today. So I'm I'm enjoying the ex musical experience. Yeah. Yeah. So I want to leave uh, you and the listeners with R&B um, off of your album Point of View. Um, yeah, that that's the one with me and Fred Wesley. Oh, yeah. so we're going to turn up a notch. Yeah, you could call it that. Okay. <laughs> change the beat. Let's change <laughs> the beat. All right, sounds good to me. WNCU Kids Artist Series with Robert Trowers. Here's R&B after the short pause.
Seven WNCU member supported radio. Welcome back to a fantastic hour of WNCU Cares Artist Series with Robert Trowers sharing fabulous, really, really interesting stories about his uh, past as a musician in Brooklyn in the Cal Basie band, Duke Ellington. Wait, you, not Duke Ellington. I, I, did a, I did a couple, a couple road tours with Ellington. I wouldn't call myself a definite member, but I did mm-hmm. do a couple uh, but you caught, tours. Call for the gig, so that, that <laughs> <laughs> says a lot. Um, and then also jazz at Lincoln Center. Yeah, that was uh, after I left the Daisy Band. Actually, mm-hmm. um, that was uh, I did a did a couple tours, a European tour and a um, an American tour with them. And uh, was end of, of uh, a love affair one of the songs on their bill? No, that was the no, song we just no, heard. That, y'all. Yeah, that was mm-hmm. uh, no, that was just another one of those tunes that I I really like the mm-hmm. standard, and um, yeah. that one I arranged for all four trombones myself, Fred Wesley, um, Side Hampton, and Al Gray. Mm-hmm. So you they know. sounded great. All of you all sounded great together. Nice blend of trombones. Uh, is it is it widely done? Tri- trombone quartets. I know yeah, chamber actually, music, but actually, um, back in the fifties, there are quite a few albums made uh, with two. Actually, J. J. Johnson and Kai Winding had a two trombone group, mm-hmm. and they used to do a lot of other folks had four trombones, and mm-hmm. actually, there was one that had eight eight oh. trombones. Actually, Slide Hampton had probably the most impressive eight trombone uh, group that mm. I'd heard is called The World of Trombones. I, I think they think only did one album. I play their yeah. music. Uh, we can get some, some of their music in here. We'd, I'd love to hear that. Um, Actually, the to me, one of the most impressive things on that album mm-hmm. was uh, the first thing. It's only like a minute and a half long. It's called Corral that oh. Slide wrote, and it's uh, just a beautiful minute and a half of music yeah i'm gonna need to find that definitely want to hear some of that before the time is up but i want to hear more of your stories you share some really great stories about your experience um i know you you taught in the public school system for some time yes i did (laughs) uh that new york city public schools uh was actually interestingly i think the most difficult assignment i had was my very first one what was was, that uh, it was at a middle school in uh brownsville which uh was a section of brooklyn that uh well i guess i guess the best the best way to to sum up brownsville is mike tyson's from brownsville okay (laughs) (laughs) sums it up (laughs) yeah so it was it was um a pretty um interesting experience in that okay you know you had to figure out a way to get to the students mm-hmm. you know I mean, did you have a method uh other than yelling I tried to, <laughs> yeah yeah i mean yeah because yelling only works so so Ooh. far you know right. but uh it was just a, a mix of different different techniques mm-hmm. you know that mm-hmm. um it's like no one correct way to reach no, a child no because mm-hmm. it's it depends on on the teacher as well you know yes. i mean i don't i'm not a pit, particularly loud person or mm, yes i remember or demonstrative <laughs> so mm-hmm. uh that with younger students can be sometimes uh boring i guess <laughs> <laughs> you know they like and and it's actually in the lower grades being the more animated you are is probably the better I was gonna you know, say. when you're like you know k through four oh, five yes. you know animation you know really helps and uh they needed excitement yeah yeah <laughs> you know i i call it entertainment you know mm-hmm. it's the, mm-hmm. and um and you were a music teacher Strangely <laughs> enough, no. Uh, okay. Actually, in the middle school, <laughs> I taught science. Uh, well, you were in mechanical engineering, teacher. so. Well, yeah, that, that, that uh, but I mean, anybody science. can teach middle school science. <laughs> <laughs> I 
I guess I should say that. Uh oh. Right? <laughs> Not anybody. We love you, educators. I'm an educator. Yeah, yeah for sure. No, actually, we're, all we're all educators. We're all educators, aren't we? But um, what I mean is that the level of science is not really mm -hmm. that high. So, I mean, yeah. the material's not going to give you problems as a as mm. a college graduate but okay you know yeah. it's a ma it's a matter of how do you get it across the real test the is the the children right <laughs> yeah yeah and that was that was a challenge mm -hmm. i mean the whole time it was a, it was a challenge it got better of course yeah. as time went on but uh did you ever teach music in new york Actually, the last, before I came here, yeah, yeah, the last five years, I was actually music appreciation. Ah. I never had, I I only had a an ensemble maybe mm -hmm. in the last couple years that I taught in New York. Okay. And that was after, it took about a year, just, I, I inherited like a room full of broken instruments. So oh. I had to like locate a <laughs> yeah. repairman and then secure funding from exactly. the school and then have the instruments repaired little by little then mm -hmm. we started putting a little um ensemble together mm -hmm. but uh it, it took a while you know mm -hmm. and in a way i felt a little guilty about about leaving because we were just kind of getting to the point <laughs> where yeah it's like and, those life changing uh, moments what yeah, do you do stay yeah. in new york yeah because yeah I, I never thought i would leave new york first mm -hmm. of all um and uh, when this opportunity came up, you know, I'd always wanted to teach university level because mm -hmm. I kind of felt like with the experience I had, there might be something I could offer. And, and uh, so was. I was like, OK, I got to I got to take this to and see at least see what happens, you know. And so somebody heard about you in New York or while you were on the bandstand, they heard well, you play? Well, actually, you mean f to, for this? To uh, get this position. Well, yet. actually, I had um, known Dr. Wiggins from uh, some, when I was with the Basie Band, we used to do a uh, artist residency at Hampton University, and he mm -hmm. brought his bands. And like I was telling you before, we, we ended up tying him for first place with a um, another band that was technically really good but his band just had such a great feel you know we in the Basie band just figured there's no way we can deny this band first place because mm -hmm. they just have such a great feel they swing and oh they, yes and and that's really in the end what it's about mm -hmm. and uh and so every time the band would come, we, if we played the Carolina Theater or if we played uh, somewhere like that, I'd call him and, you know, I'd come come through the uh, band room and, you know, work with them a little. Mm -hmm. And uh, so when, the, when this came up, Dr. Wiggins gave me a call and said, look, can you, you know, this I've got this position. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, like I also told you, he called me a week and a half after my dad had had yeah. a stroke. So I told him I couldn't do it. And yeah. I gave him the phone numbers of some really good musicians, uh, Vincent Gardner and mm. uh, some other great trombone players. And uh, my dad was the one that told me, no, take that job, you know. You mm -hmm. gotta. And so once, once I saw he was going to be okay. <laughs> yeah, right. Mm -hmm. You know, once I saw he was going to be okay, I decided, yeah. okay, well... Let me call, and I I started out with well, I guess that position's taken, right? And Doctor Wigan said, well, no, nobody's uh, responded yet. Yeah. So, yeah, and it was the rest mixed. is history. Exactly, <laughs> and that's it. You're here, and that's what matters. And you actually have some great ensembles. You've uh, on your so your website is entitled Robert Trower is called Robert dot com. Right, and listeners if you go out there you click on his website you can hear all of his well most of his music um on his website and it just plays continuously like, i i enjoy listening to it and how you molded uh the musicians from central yeah, yeah well actually i was really proud of the brass ensemble yeah that was they sounded like, great uh, yeah they they really did a great job on uh both tunes the uh one was uh a James Reese Europe tune, the uh, Hesitating Blues, which is uh, from 1919, I think. And uh, that was really, um, they really did a great job on that. And then the other one was more modern, which was uh, McCoy Tyner's Twilight Mist. Yes. Which um, I, I did the arrangement on that. And uh, we, 
I was really, we had a great group of students right in that era. That was around, what, 2011, I think? Yeah. Uh, I, somewhere around there. I know. I think I was still here. Yeah. I would like to play Twilight Mist. Okay. Let's see great. if we can play it from the internet. So here we go.
NCCU Brass Ensemble on Twilight Mist at 90.7 yeah. WNCU. Wow. Yeah, that was, uh, I think my chest was high for about two weeks yeah. after that day. I, I was so proud of <laughs> they sounded the way great. They, uh, they, they, they turned out. It was really, um, that was a great group with Leroy Barley and James Noel Fields on trumpet. Mm -hmm. It was myself and Reg Reginald uh, Greenlee on trombones, mm -hmm. Steve McKeever on baritone, Donovan Scott on tuba and uh tyler leak on drums it's yeah. just uh you know and and i like the bra that brass ensemble because it's compact it's not as big as like a traditional brass ensemble mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. uh it gets a really they get they got a really full sound and uh all of yeah. them were breathing well uh it sounded great. It, there was something like a, the the swing of it, you know, the pulse, mm -hmm. the pulse of the. It just kept me. I um envisioned dancing on the floor just all night long. The, the pulse was there. I really, yeah. really enjoyed listening to that. Yeah, it's a great tune. I mean, it's mm -hmm. McCoy Tyner's tune. I heard it mm -hmm. on the uh, Tomcat album, which was a uh, Lee Morgan album. In fact, mm -hmm. I heard it driving home from Central on WNCU, mm -hmm. and I said, "Man, I gotta get, I gotta, yeah. I gotta write this too for the brass ensemble." Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So that's four part brass. Was that five part? Five. Five part brass. Yeah. And so, kind of, what's your writing like? What do you? What's your approach to writing? <sighs> Oh man, that's uh, is that another interview? <laughs> that's uh, that's an interesting question. Mm -hmm. uh, my my um, approach to writing is get on the keyboard mm -hmm. and try some voicings, and if a voicing sounds good, you write it for the horns. <laughs> that sounds fair enough. That, so. That's what I do. I mean, uh, I, I'm not um, real theoretical. Mm -hmm. uh, I was more, you know, one of the reasons I started writing was uh, I used to be in this rehearsal band made up of a bunch of older guys in Brooklyn, uh, mm -hmm. Ray Abrams, who was a mm -hmm. tenor saxophonist with uh, Dizzy Gillespie's band mm -hmm. in the 40s. He used to have a rehearsal band from the 60s, and they had kept going all these years with different guys. Mm -hmm. And so I used to go down, and uh, a couple of my other friends and I, we were like the youngest guys in the group by like 30, 40 years. Wow. And uh, they were very encouraging. Mm -hmm. And, you know, after we started playing and we could play the arrangements pretty well, they started telling us, man, you should write something. You, know, mm. you, should, you don't have to write a whole arrangement. Just write eight measures and we'll play it for you. And then, you know, we could, and so that's sort of how it started. You just start nice. writing. And um, that's that was the method I used. Just, just start if something writing. sounded good, mm -hmm. if, if it was a good sounding voicing, write it out for the horns <laughs> that sounds so, so simple and that's yeah. where why you are where you are <laughs> just keeping it light you have another uh, song for i guess the ncc brass ensemble i see um hesitating blues right and that was uh that was actually made famous by james reese europe's 369th um infantry band in 1919 mm -hmm. uh and <coughs> i had had a, a um a, and a lifetime membership to the 369th Historical Society, which is mm. in uh, New York, because mm -hmm. that's where all the music was. And I used to go down there, um, and the uh, the late um, uh, Major uh, James, who used to be the uh, the president. He would just he just told me, well, you know, just go down there and see what you find, you mm -hmm. know. And mm -hmm. uh, so I was able to. He allowed me to take things out and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, scan them. And so what we played here is actually one of the uh, original arrangements from James Reese Europe's 1919 uh, 369th Infantry Band. And they're playing it with precision. So you're about to hear. The song, Hesitating Blues, at Member Supporter Radio, 90.7 WNCU.
WNCU Cares Artist Series. You're hearing Robert Trowers on Sleep Bop off of his album Point of View. And that was bopping. He's playing yeah, some was, heavy uh, material. That was a fun, fun little tune. Uh, I thought it fit Al Gray's personality. Yeah. <clears throat> I had, I can't say I wrote it with him in mind, okay. but I had just been writing tunes. And uh, when this came up, I, f- I felt like this was a tune that kind of fit his playing. You mm-hmm. know? So, mm-hmm. hmm. and, so you, you know, the title oh. Sleep Bop is just actually it, it's an onomatopoeia okay. for the actual the first two notes of the tune Sleep Bop. Ah, so that's what it really it's split just Sleep Bop. <laughs> nice. Yeah, just the, the the phrasing of the first two two notes just sound like that. Yeah, you know? so. Again, simple, that. like you said. Very simple. <laughs> um, but, you know, I think, was it Duke Ellington? He wrote a lot of simple melodies. But just, True. You know, you w- you open up the uh, the room. You leave room for the improv- 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 right. to improvise. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Um, but, you know, you, you, you just want to keep a simple melody, you know, so somebody can sing it. Right. Is that what you keep in mind? Well, yeah. It, At least the, a little I bit mean, of it. I mean, when... When I write melodies, I'm sort of thinking that way, mm-hmm. you know, that they should be. Uh, but it doesn't always have to be. You can have some great melodies that necessarily aren't that singable. Um, this True. is a kind of uh, historical minutia, but I, I used to <laughs> play with a big band in uh, New York There's uh, by um, that was led by a guy named Charles Bird. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Not the guitarist. This was, He was a saxophonist, oh. but... He had a really interesting big band book that didn't sound like anything else. And it wasn't until I did an interview with him, He, one of the things that we used to play, he mentioned, he said, well, you know, this particular section of the arrangement, mm-hmm. what I, what he actually tried to do is create a singable tone row. Oh. And it was like, wow, you know, I never thought of that. He was like... He he made a a, a, t- a tone row that was actually like something you could remember and sing. Wow, okay. And I, I didn't I didn't ever realize that until years after I'd played with the band. You know that I, did, mm. I went back to him in his later years and mm-hmm. interviewed him, and he told me, yeah, you know that's what I was trying to do there. You know, and he succeeded. So yeah, so yeah singable is good. <laughs> yes, it is. I mean, I'm certain somebody's singing it right now. Well, you are listening to WNCU Cares Artist Series. I have in the studio Mr. Robert Trowers, a former professor of mine. I'm excited that, or happy that you came in to impart wisdom and st- and share stories. Um, yeah, well, I'm happy you called me. It's yeah. good to be here. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm happy that I could play two hours worth of your material so people can really hear how you how you sound you know um are you working on any other projects um i can't say i am i i am working on a number of different things mm-hmm, mm-hmm. um with uh with the covid situation you yeah, know with getting yeah. together rehearsals that sort of thing it's not uh it, it's funny the things we took for granted before right right you know just just getting together with people now but you can space deal. out yeah, you know, yeah, you can distance space yourself. out. If it's a small group, yeah, yeah, you can do that. But you know, as you know, when you're t- talking about music like this, mm-hmm. you want to you want to be close so you can hear everything and yes. respond to it right away. And mm-hmm. six foot distance doesn't necessarily uh, makes that a little harder. Let's put it that way. Yeah, you know? we're still connected, but I understand. I understand yeah. the uh, the power of humans. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, ladies and gentlemen, you've been listening to Robert Trowers um, share his stories and about his career, and he has a a wealth of information. If you would like to uh, check him even out further, you can go to his website at roberttrowers.com, and he's on Facebook as well. Yeah, I'm on Facebook uh, infrequently, but I'm trying to get better. You're there. (laughs) (laughs) You're there. That's what matters, right? Uh, But thank you so much for being here. I want to thank you for having me. My pleasure. And maybe sometime down the road we can have an ensemble in here to perform. Yeah. That would be great. Interestingly enough, the, the the brass ensemble did actually play in here years I ago. I must have not been here. Yeah. I, I think missed you might have been. Oh, I missed that. But since you're not a brass player, I guess. 
<laughs> I didn't get the uh, the memo. Thank yeah, right. you. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's another um, a cover, Deed I Do, and then the joint is jumping. Okay. You have anything to say about those? No, just two tunes I liked and yeah. uh, decided it was a good time to record them. It's a great time to hear them right now. So let's hear D and I do. The joint is jumping. If we have time, we want to play some more of your music up to the top of the set. Okay. And then when we return, well, I won't return, but DL is going to be after here on Afternoon Jazz. Okay, great. And then playing some more jazz for your listening appetite. So thanks so much, everyone, for listening to WNCU Cares Artist Series with Robert Trowers. Tune in to hear who's the next guest for next week. But right now, let's hear trombone action on Did I Do and the joint is jumping. Have a good afternoon.
Bye-bye. 